Hello and welcome to Triage, timely conversations for healthcare professionals, a podcast created and produced by KNL Gates. Each episode is designed to highlight important developments in health law and analyze the impact on our clients and friends of the firm. We hope you enjoy this podcast. Hi, everyone, and thanks for listening to Triage. My name is Macy Flinchen, and I'm an attorney in the firm's Research Triangle Park office. And today I'm joined by two partners, Lee Mocherian and Steve Pine. Steve, you want to introduce yourself? Hey, yeah, great. Uh, Nice to be with you, Macy and Limo. I'm Steve Pine, a partner in the RTP office, um, and glad to be back on triage uh, talking about one of my favorite topics, value-based care. Steve, I'm right there with you. Uh, Limo Cherian from the firm's Chicago office, healthcare partner, and I co-lead the healthcare and FDA practice. And value-based is also one of my favorite topics, and it's really exciting to be able to talk about where we are at this point. Thanks, Limo and Steve. As you both mentioned, we wanted to talk a little bit today about some of the successes and lessons learned from the newly adopted flexibilities for value-based care arrangements under both the federal anti-kickback statute and the Stark Law. It's been about two and a half years now since the Department of Health and Human Services finalized changes, including new safe harbor protections for certain coordinated care and risk-sharing arrangements between her providers that meet certain new safe harbor and exception criteria. Steve, could you give us just a brief refresher on some of those changes? Yeah, happy to, Macy. Yeah, just to orient ourselves a little bit. In the value-based space prior to these final rules, There was a lot of um, goals related to value-based care that were problematic um, and ran up into friction with some of the restrictions under Stark and under the kickback statute as it relates to things like um, having a ACO or clinically integrated network wanting to direct referrals similar to a PPO network where we have a provider-led network that starts to run into uh, potential conflict under the kickback statute or where an ACO or SIN wants to um, offer free or reduced cost items or services to incentivize value-based care, or to provide shared savings or incentive payments on the back end to reward uh, successes in value-based care. So what we saw are a variety of both new um, stark exceptions and kickback safe harbors that are designed around what's called a value-based enterprise framework that contained a, a variety of new regulatory requirements, as well as some um, new and modified safe harbors outside of the value-based enterprise framework um, that are designed to promote arrangements that have quality and value attributes and incentives. Thanks, Steve. So these new changes have been around for a couple of years now. What kind of response have you seen from the provider community? So, Macy, you know, I have to say that, first of all, it's hard to believe we're two and a half years since the, since these were promulgated. And these rules were anticipated for such a long time. You know, as Steve mentioned, the traditional fraud and abuse regulations really made value-based arrangements problematic. If there was a goal fundamentally to reduce overall utilization in some way, that would just generally fall afoul of various regulations that prevent you from rewarding that kind of behavior. So this was really just widely anticipated. And then the rules came out and they were very complicated. And there are two completely different sets of regulations, as Steve mentioned, for the kickback statute and then for the Stark referral statute, self-referral statute. So really part of this, you know, the first period of time is providers spent a bunch of time trying to figure out what does this mean? What do these two sets of criteria mean? And then all of the procedural requirements that were um, implemented, again, to build in safeguards. And basically, you know, if you all recall, what basically um, CMS um, and OIG did was structure three different categories of major exceptions that increased flexibility as downside risk increased. But with that, there are still a lot of procedural requirements. So providers have actually spent a fair amount of time trying to figure out what is it that we can do in practice that fits within one of these safe harbors or exceptions? And that has taken a lot of time and a lot of energy has gone into it. And it's been difficult for, for folks to implement. I'm not sure if CMS or IG had any real understanding of how complicated this would be to implement. Yeah. And in conjunction with that, you know, outside of even the value-based space, there were a number of changes as it relates to kickback and Stark and sort of the traditional 
fraud and abuse analysis. And so I think a lot of attention has also gone into how those changes to the sort of the traditional kickback safe harbors and stark exceptions have impacted operations. So things like changes to the um, personal services um, safe harbor and how you can now, rather than needing to have aggregate compensation be set in advance, now just the methodology can be set in advance. So a lot of uh, time and attention has gone into how that can impact future arrangements, as well as some of the new start flexibilities, including um, isolated transactions, um, exceptions, and, and, and changes to the way uh, indirect compensation is calculated. So in, in addition to all these value-based changes that are going on with these final rules, we had in parallel a lot of these sort of traditional um, uh, stark and kickback uh, analyses that have also been updated. And Steve, I think part of the issue with that is that the traditional ones, it, most of those um, requirements got less stringent, right? So it's sometimes easier to implement a less stringent something that you're familiar with than implement something that's completely new in these value-based safe harbors that you are now building from scratch or trying to tailor your existing ACO or SIN into. So that decision point was really sort of an interesting one for providers to think about, okay, is my SIN a VBE? And if it is, which category and what, what type of risk? So really, I think that it was really a decision that providers were saying, what can organizations do? What kind of risk do our providers want to take? So that's really, I think, um, you know, overall on a high level, how the provider community has reacted. With any change or new safe harbor, you know, I think you're going to expect some period of learning or a learning curve as providers, you know, get used to learning how to take advantage of these flexibilities. And particularly here, given the complexity in the safe harbors, what challenges have you all seen um, for providers trying to take advantage of the flexibility? Well, the, I think the first you can mention, I mean, it is exactly that complexity. As Limo kind of mentioned, this whole new idea of a value-based enterprise framework really requires um, providers to sort of start from scratch and think top down in terms of how they can structure uh, an arrangement to take advantage of these new flexibilities. So this isn't a situation where you can sort of take an existing arrangement, tweak it slightly, and then all of a sudden have a whole bunch of new flexibilities that you can take advantage of. Um, the level of complexity and sort of the number of boxes you have to check and the, the, the regulatory requirements you have to meet sort of requires that more holistic approach, which I think has been a challenge. Um, you know, just has a longer runway to to um, to enter into an arrangement than if you could just make a couple tweaks to something you already have in place. And Steve, I think another you know additional challenge is that you know I think we talked about this in our original white paper is that several of these arrangements require a pair to collaborate. You can't just do this on your own. You need to get a payer engaged. And we've regularly heard from providers that it has been very difficult to get payer um, engagement uh, other than what they're currently doing. Getting payers to, to work with you on a more defined, non-traditional, not your basic, you know, shared savings model type agreement that they're used to. They, each of the payers has their model. So trying to, to fit that into one of these can be very challenging. And folks are trying to create something new you have to get a payer involved. And that's not really um, just a regulatory requirement too, right? I mean, it's just a practical operational reality of the way that these arrangements will need to be structured is that you're going to need um, a payer to be a collaborator. Um, it, it just in terms of um, how you're going to be setting up benchmarks, how you're going to be setting up your target patient population. It, it's sort of operationally necessary um, for uh, yeah, a payer to be a partner in that in that process, and so to your point, um, until it's where you have a, a bi-directional buy-in, that can that can be an additional challenge. In addition to the payer issue, I think there's also just a fundamental issue in terms of risk sharing. I mean, as I mentioned, these risk side models, both the Stark and the AKS side, uh, increase flexibility as you increase risk, but that fundamentally means that you limit what you can do in the care coordination or value-based arrangements, which is the no risk on both the Stark and the kickback side. And one of these has been a challenge as to whether to flow down risk from the value-based enterprise to individual participants. And that has been a, has been a tremendous challenge. 
Um, I think, you know, physician practices in particular are just not willing to take on risk. Um, sometimes there are large physician practices that are able to do that, but a lot of these VBE participants are just not financially interested or able to take on the townside risk that CMS and OIG are requiring. And that's probably especially true when we start talking about the full financial risk safe harbor, you know, because if you look at how that is structured in the safe harbor, the VBE is going to have to take on full responsibility for all items and services covered by that payer for the target part patient population. So in sort of the traditional SIN model where you are providing services to a broad target patient population, and if you're defining your target patient population broadly, now all of a sudden you are going to be at risk for just a tremendous amount of, of items and services and claims. And even if you are narrowing that to a target population that's for, you know, for example, a particular clinical condition, you're going to be at risk not just for the items and services tied to treating that clinical condition. Again, it's all items and services that that target patient population incurs over, for that payer over the course of the year. So, again, that's just a, a further enhanced level of risk um, that probably goes above and beyond what a lot of of SINs and ACOs are currently set up to handle. And then, you know, another sort of um, consideration here is that for, for providers that are already participating in the Medicare Shared Savings Program or through other CMMI models, a number of those programs have their own fraud and abuse waivers that providers can be eligible for that um, if you have particular arrangements that are tied to um, MSSP patients or other CMMI uh, model patients, um, you can sort of skip the step of needing to structure it in alignment with these new Stark and kickback safe harbors because you can just take advantage of the, the fraud and abuse waivers associated with that program. So I think for some clients, it's been a little bit of a, you know, maybe kick the can down the road because we can structure it as part of our current MSSP model, and that's just a lot easier. And I think one other aspect of this that has been interesting is that, you know, CMS obviously um, and OIG excluded specific types of providers and entities from participating in the value-based safe harbors. You know, it, you know, they from the initial to the final, they expanded to include pharmacies, but, you know, PBMs, device manufacturers, DME suppliers, um, they're not eligible to participate. And those are the types of entities that often actually have interest in participating in these types of um, arrangements. And so that is something that has, I think, you know, also sort of stifled the use of these more in a more wide way that in, in, in manner that those types of entities could participate. I mean, obviously, the OIG and CMS have you know determined that those were ineligible based on their underlying risks of fraud and abuse. But within the context of a value-based enterprise, you know, not allowing those entities to participate in any way really does restrict, you know, the type of collaborative arrangements that can be done. Understanding there are certainly some real challenges and complexities that eligible providers should be aware of when considering entering into these types of arrangements. Where have we seen real successes? Are there certain types of arrangements um, that are better suited for these requirements? Yeah, we can we can probably discuss a few here. So so one I'll mention. Uh, you know, so outside of this um, value-based enterprise structure, we saw in the updates to the um, personal services safe harbor, this idea of an exclusion of the definition of remuneration for outcome-based payment incentives. And so that's been an area where there's been, I think, quite a lot of activity where um, how those can typically be structured is you have one provider organization who has a value-based payment arrangement with a payer, and they're looking to partner with um, another provider that's part of their referral network and incentivize um, certain value-based outcomes, certain value-based outcome quality measures, and be able to provide incentives to that, uh, you know, referring provider for meeting that. And so um, the outcome-based um, payment incentive uh, safe Harbor provides an avenue for folks to do that. It, it like the other Safe Harbors, has a decent amount of regulatory complexity, um, but it's overall sort of easier to meet because you don't need to do it within this broader value-based enterprise structure. Although, I mean, 
one key item, I mean, there's again a, a number of regulatory elements to meet, to meet there, but one key item is it's only designed to protect outcome-based measures. So not all, not the entire universe of quality measures that you might conceive of. You know, for example, it doesn't include process measures of are you checking blood pressure? Are you screening for depression? It has to be tied to patients actually achieving certain quality outcomes. Um, but we've seen a number of arrangements that have fit within that safe harbor. And I think, you know, Steve, I mean, the, that distinction between, for instance, process-based metric and an outcome-based metric is something that we've seen over the years in terms of, you know, clinically integrated networks and ACOs is that it is harder to achieve the result than it is to implement the process. So, you know, while it makes sense to that this is where CMS and OIG want to go, it's just fundamentally harder to re reduce somebody's, blood, you know, you know, hemoglobin A1C rather than actually measure it. That's exactly right. I think one of the other things that, that we've seen, you know, one of the challenges is basically so many things involve what is your target pa patient population and then what you have to implement across this. So some of the, the models that we've seen have been designed to basically reduce the size of that patient population to a manageable um, set. Uh, and then you can implement the VBA. So as an example, we've seen um, episodic uh, episodes of care models, which basically, you know, they're typically looking at whether it's a specific condition or a specific procedure and then building a VBE around that. And that really has been something that where you can, again, reduce the size of that patient population so that you can implement the requirements of the, the risk share, which, again, episodic falls into the second category of risk. So it's not full risk, but it's not it's not the no risk care coordination. So you get some flexibilities there and you can literally try to reduce that population because one of the things is that we you have to basically take risk for the services to those patients. So if you are focused on a specific type of patient, whether again, linked to an orthopedic procedure, linked through an organ transplant, linked to anything specific that is really focused on which is this specific population that we're going to be targeting. That has been something that I think, you know, you know, has is has been, you know, successful. Um, similarly, like special purpose sins, you know, whether that's a service line focused co-management where you're really focused on a, a smaller group. Um, that, I think, is another thing that we've seen that has been successful, um, at least in terms of like being able to try to meet all of the requirements because you're not implementing this across, for instance, your entire MA population for a plan. That's right. And it's worth mentioning the care coordination safe harbor as well. Um, again, it is a lot more limiting than some of the other safe harbors in that it's only going to apply to a particular type of arrangement. It's got to be tied to you know, the care coordination of a patient population as opposed to any value-based purpose. It has to be only tied to in-kind remuneration as opposed to monetary, you know, just, just providing funds. Um, and there's a cost share requirement. So um, uh, on the one hand, it's, it's going to be more limited in terms of the scope of arrangements that can take advantage of it. But because it does not have that risk sharing component, if you've got an arrangement that you think could fit within those parameters, it's going to be a lot easier, easier to meet the, the regulatory requirements. You know, I think, again, for providers who participate, it's easier to look at a 15% cost share that you know what that's going to look like, right, as opposed to a 15 as opposed to a risk share where you don't have any sense of what the downside is going to be overall. So I definitely think that you're right, that care coordination does, um, you know, give you some more flexibilities. And frankly, I mean, I mean, providing actual financial remuneration or providing services or items that uh, are covered from a from the standpoint of the receiver, it, it's not. I mean, it's it's money's fungible, right? So this is if it buys something and it gets you the thing as or the person instead of the actual dollars. It it is it does provide a lot of flexibility. We've seen these in you know in terms of things that you might not be able to otherwise do, like you know whether it's for CME for instance, things that you might be able to 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 do in a way that you wouldn't be able to do outside of these types of um, outside of the safe harbors. Before we conclude today, I want to ask one more question. Just taking everything we've learned so far, how should providers be thinking about taking advantage of these safe harbors moving forward? Well, one thing I think is is continuing to evaluate appetite for risk share among provider participants in a clinically integrated network. To Limo's earlier point, I think a big limiting factor 
in taking advantage of some of these risk share models is the fact that that risk has to, at least a portion of that risk, has to ultimately flow through the, the SIN, the VBE, and ultimately reach the provider participants. So, um, you know, as the, pop, the, the provider population gets more comfortable with risk, um, as we just get more sophisticated in dealing with value-based models, um, that's going to unlock a lot of possibilities going forward. Yeah, I mean, I think, again, part of this is looking early. I mean, people have talked about gain sharing. So the question is, is the old gain sharing model completely gone now that you have value-based? Can you actually structure these more safely, you know, because of these flexibilities? But it's important to decide that early. It's important to look at an arrangement, particularly with the payer, and say, does this qualify us to use one of the safe harbors? Um, and if that's true, is it appropriately structured to unlock those flexibilities? So I think it's, you know, you know, obviously understanding what your participants' risk tolerance is, as Steve's mentioned, but also just looking at the opportunities and keeping this value-based lens, saying, is there a way that this can be implemented in a way that meets the value-based? I mean, on the flip side, if you're starting from the, from the value-based and saying, I want to meet one of these, it really is important to work through this early so that you're meeting all of the requirements. Um, you know, it's it takes um, some doing, but I do think that there's still flexibility to be unlocked um, in these in these arrangements. And part of this is just the commitment to be able to actually understand what your payer uh, participation is, what your partic what your VBE sponsor, if there is one, uh, and then your participants in terms of really understanding how to structure everything. Well, that concludes our time today. Thanks again to you both, Limo, Steve, for joining us. Um, and thank you for listening. And who knows, maybe in another couple of years, we'll, we'll regroup and talk about more lessons learned. Thanks again. Thanks again for listening to Triage, timely conversations for healthcare professionals. New episodes are available for download through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. By subscribing to Triage, you will receive timely notifications for each new episode. Also, if you have any topics you would like to hear discussed on Triage, please don't hesitate to email triagesupport at klgates.com. We would love to hear from you.